like a higher order, like a function callback, which takes a number and returns a number. In TypeScript, it is necessary to uh, to annotate all the input parameters. This is just the way how TypeScript works. Um, TypeScript is clever enough to guess the return type, so it will know that this is a number. And now with this function definition, I can uh, happily map over a number of array, like an array of numbers, just map over it, and this is uh, checked. So if you w would like to introduce a string in this array, it will uh, complain that this is not possible. And now let's look at the flow example. Here the only difference is that I don't have to uh, mention the type of the input parameter. And this is because how the type inference works. It just sees like flow flows through your program and sees at the end of the statement, okay, you're trying to increment this value. So it must be either a number or a string. So it does some kind of like type refinement, it keeps it in its memory, and um, then it will just know, okay, this is working. So this is really pleasant if you're doing a lot of like function callbacks and you don't want like, if you're in a function body, you don't want to annotate everything. You want to experiment, you want to try things out and you just want the type checker to tell you what you're doing wrong. So it's very suitable for functional patterns. So if you have this kind of compose function, which you know probably from Redux or from Recompose, if you're using React, um, this is just a mathematical concept. You can do it with every function. You can do it with UI components, you can do it with that, whatever. So if we have an increment 6 function which compose of these three increment functions, one increments 1, uh, the second one increments 2, and the third one increments 3. And if we get this new function back, we can just call it with another number. So what it does, it's like it passes in the 2, it does the first function, the output is 3, the, the output will be piped into the next function, it's increment uh, 2, 3 plus 2 is 5, and so on and so on. So this is a shortcut, um, the result of increment 6. So this is like how composing of functions work. And in this project I was mentioning before in Lagoon, we have this API, which is a GraphQL server. And we use um, a library called uh, Ram.js, which is a functional utility library like Lodash. And don't be scared, it's like a, just a small example of how code can look like. Uh, looks a little bit cryptic, so if you're not trained to the eye, it's very hard to read. Compose reads from the bottom to the top because it's always like the, the last function will be called first. We put in the object, we uh, have a utility function pick, which picks certain attributes from my object. I get the server identifier, the server infrastructure, then I uh, call the values function, which gets the output of this function, and so on and so on. And you can also do uh, declarative if-else statements and stuff like this. You won't, you will probably not find any value in this because you were like, okay, I can write this in an imperative way and it's much easier. Um, but as soon as you try this out, you figure out that it's much, much easier to refactor code. Everything is kind of like um, uh, well settled because you can introduce immutable data structures and so on. And also it's just kind of funny that you take one of these functions and you can rearrange them inside this one statement. If you're like in an imperative way, you need to restructure a lot of code and then something will break. I find this way much more pleasing uh, to work with. The problem is JavaScript, like the syntax, it looks very verbose, it looks very tedious to, to read. And like the state how it is right now, it's very hard to type check. So I want something a little bit more um, suitable for functional programming. Um, yeah, we also have function patterns with React. So we have this uh, pure function component. So if we put in a props object with a user string, uh, Flow will uh, happily take that, or TypeScript will happily take that, and you can also validate your GSX inside there. So it will also type check your GSX, which is very, very pleasant. And this is very important, because um, if you have a React Native application, for instance, you have a JavaScript main thread. If this JavaScript main thread explodes because you have a null pointer exception, the whole application will quit. So if you try to introduce JavaScript into your you know, app code base, you want to make sure that this main thread doesn't crash. And a type checker will make sure that you will never have a null pointer exception again. Reliable type inference will motivate experimentation changes, is what I kind of tried to, to express. So if I think about Java, it's like, uh, okay, 
I would like to introduce a new entity, so what do I need to do? Okay, um, I need to introduce a new class, which uh, is the user object. Then I need to introduce, I don't know, like uh, properties, and I need to type them, and I need to generate getters and setters, and I need to, you know? It's like, you just wanted to try out one function with one data structure, and then you suddenly have to create a whole universe, um, which is bad. Also, another thing is, uh, like, Perl and TypeScript are structurally typed, so, if you define a function which just defines a certain uh, shape with certain attributes, you can just pass in any object with this shape. And it's not like in Java where you have to create a user object. You need to instantiate a user object just to use the, the name property or something. Okay, and now let's go a little bit into the dark side of this whole thing. There are some trust killers in flow type. And these are like my, my biggest enemy right now, especially with this uh, Rum.js function you just saw. And there's a type called any. And the funny fact is, any is not a type. Any is just a placeholder for the type which might be in there. Then we have another thing, which is called object, which is a little bit more specific, a little bit more concrete, you know? It's like, nice to have, but still, the attribute keys are untyped. And then we have a function, which is even worse, because a function has an input and an output, and both of them are any by default. So if I have a function, you can be lazy and say, okay, I don't know what the input value is, so I cannot really define it in a static, statically typed way. I can use the any keyword and be, be done. The problem is, yeah, also it's sometimes very useful if you're having like some tests and something, and you're like, okay, I know this test input is correct, just don't complain about this, and you can cast it to any. And then, if you cast this to any, as I said, it's a placeholder for a certain type, you can type cast it to whatever type you want. And this is, whenever you use any, you're automatically introducing runtime exceptions. Like, there is a possibility that a runtime exception will occur. And we don't want that. That's the whole point of type, type checking that you don't need that. And if you take this a little bit up to a higher level. So we have a function with an input value and an output value, t1 and t2. And when we think about the compose chain, what I was talking about, in between, if somewhere in between I introduce an any value, the any value will cause an any value outside, maybe. And if, like, the output value of the first function, then the any will bleed through the whole chain, which is really, really bad because you don't know where to track down the error. So this was very problematic. And even further, if you lift the function a little bit higher, we have a module. So if you have a module called lodash, lodash has a function called map. So if this is not well typed, this whole thing will bleed through your whole code base. Okay, we don't want that. So what we want, what we want is, I try to define what, what I believe is an ideal application. So if you have an application, we, we start out with modeling our types. We have certain entities we want to handle, we have user objects, we have uh, project objects, or whatever. And these are just type information. They are not really runtime information. And based on that, we have the business logic, which is handling these types. You're like transforming user objects to certain view objects, or you're, uh, you're just transforming incoming data to other data structures. And then we have the UI components, which are reusing the types of the business logic. Sorry, we cannot hear you. Test, test. Does it work? Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Did you hear me the whole presentation? Yeah. 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 Awesome. <laughs> I can do it again afterwards. It was a very long talk. Though. Okay. So, um, so the UI components and the business logic are sharing the model types. So, whenever I decide, like the project manager comes to me and says, you know the user should have an email, could you add that? Or maybe, oh, the, the ID of this user is now a, a number and not a string anymore because the database team decided elsewise. You just change the attribute type of this specific model and you will see in your application where the code breaks, right? So we have an interlock of these definitions. We have a well-specified application which is very easy to refactor. And I call it my little castle. It's like, a, it's like a little fortress, it has a little door. And the little door is useful for getting the data in because an application which doesn't compute any data is a very useless application. Also an application which doesn't render anything is also a very useless application. 
So we make a partly typed architecture. We have our fortress in the middle, it's the app, and now we have certain um, entities which come in and out. And we have even attackers which are our users, and uh, we have our server which delivers our information. Also we have third-party libraries which we interact with. Let's start with the server communication. How can we make this well typed? So if we get JSON data, just a random JSON blob. There is a definition how a JSON looks like. It can contain strings, it can contain arrays, it can contain other JSON structures, but it's not defined like how it looks like. So we need some kind of validator in there. And I know what you're saying, validation is very hard because you need to rewrite code over and over again. It's a lot of boilerplate. So there are some things where you can reuse your type information. Um, one of them is called Flow Runtime. It's a tool where you can take the type information of your flow uh, types, which are not code. They are just in a virtual space. And you can bring them to the runtime space and add certain attributes to it. You can add validation routines and stuff like this. So uh, you can reuse type information. That's very useful. And if you're a little bit more lightweight or just want to write a little uh, schema, there's also a library which is very well uh, suitable for flow, which is called Validated. It's made by Henry Pop. He's a really, really famous uh, uh, Russian developer who works on the Reason and flow type ecosystem a lot. Um, really, really recommend it. Or you go like full, fully over engineering <laughs> and use GraphQL. Uh, we are using GraphQL. It's very nice. You have a schema and the schema kind of describes the structure of the data you're communicating with your clients and server. So you automatically can generate. There are tools for that supported by GraphQL to generate the flow types for you, or TypeScript types. And then you can just use these types, modify them a little bit how you want them, and that's it. And then you have a, just, you load the data in and that's it. You know that the data is well typed. All right, third party libraries are the worst thing in this whole thing, because we know Node.js and JavaScript has a very vast community. There's a lot of modules out there, and most of the modules are not typed. Most of them are not using TypeScript, none of them are using Flow or whatever. So what we need is some kind of wrapper, some kind of like contract, which is called a library definition. And Flow has a specific syntax for that. It looks like this. This is not code, it's basically just um, information for Flow, how to interpret the library. So whenever I'm using the library Lodash, so if I say require Lodash, uh, Flow should pick up this information, this type information. And we tell Flow specifically that this module is a common JS module which returns an object with a map attribute and this map function has a specific structure. I told you you should not use any. I did it anyways because it's easier to write right now. <laughs> so, right, like here uh, you need to like define what you want to, to handle which data structures. And for convenience, uh, I mean, I was kind of trying to contribute and talk about it, but uh, there is a project called Flowtype, which is also supported by the Flow team, and it's, a, it's similar to definitely type of TypeScript, where all the famous like libraries are hanging out, they, they wrote some library definitions already, and you can submit uh, patches if you find a bug. So there's also a CLI tool, how you can install these library definitions into your project. So everything is kind of automated. You can also read your package JSON, can interpret the versions of your packages, and download the proper library definition. So the publishing process for a library maintainer, so if you're publishing your library and you want to publish flow type definition as well, you have a library, you create your library definitions. Um, right now, the easiest is to create it manually, but I'm just trying to figure out a way how you can automate this, how you can like, take the code which is already flow typed and transport it into pure declaration. Uh, there is no way yet. Uh, I'm not sure when they will figure this out. And then you publish both of those, one to flow typed and one to NPM. And the, the consumer project then downloads the NPM module via NPM or YARN and uh, the flow definitions via the flow type CLI. So that's kind of like tedious for me right now. Okay, so then we have a fully typed architecture. So we have uh, the user interaction uh, by default, like in React. 
is handled by the library definition of React. And the library definition of React is automatically shipped with Flow. So this works. Um, and in theory, if you did everything right, if you didn't introduce too many any values in your application, you can be 90% sure that your application will run as expected. If you not run this application, you just do a refactor, and the type checker tells you zero errors, your application will work as expected. So this is kind of a huge deal if you think about it. Because you can be always sure that your uh, code base works in a way you expect it. Okay, this sounds nice and dandy. How can we improve on that? So for me, I decided that, like, as you know, TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript, and they can they have much more power because they have a uh, own language which transpiles down to JavaScript. So they are they have a much, much easier way to integrate library definitions. They have a much better way to include namespaces. And I think this is quite good. And I mean the tooling around like uh, JavaScript up like the maps and whatever does work really well. And there are just too many advantages of a certain language. Um, my problem with TypeScript is that it's not really functional, also that the type system is not as sound as flow. So they did some compromises where you say a uh, certain subtyping behavior is not well typed. And I don't like the idea of like leaving loopholes uh, just for the sake of developer experience. So I want the type safetyness. I want strong tooling where I can have autocompletion and all this stuff which, uh, which is very useful. And a lot of people will say, well, why don't you use Elm or PureScript? This sounds like a very suitable case for you, right? And not completely. Because the syntax and the concepts of like these Haskell-based languages um, is very different to what we, how we think, how we learned programming. So it's very hard to convince co-workers to say, hey, we should use a purely functional language, right? Do you know the monads and all this stuff? And everyone's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So also it's very hard to interact with JavaScript. You're having like you have a legacy jQuery application and you have some plugins which you need to use. You need this interoperability layer. And a lot of these functional languages don't really support this. So this is not an option for me. All right, so to go back. So now we have this road here. So what do I think is the best way? And it's, oh, it's ReasonML. So a lot of people already, or I actually spoiled in the description of my talk if you read it. Um, what is ReasonML actually? Uh, ReasonML is a language uh, or a syntax language built on OCaml. And OCaml is such a silly language because nobody knows it. Um, I recently discovered it when I dived into the Flow code base. Flow is written in OCaml. And it's a functional, more scientific uh, language. And the O stands for objective, so it can also do multi paradigms. It can do functional programming and it can do objective. Uh, object-oriented programming, so imperative programming. You can have, you can have for loops, you can have while loops, uh, you can do side effects in your code, you can do file I.O., whatever. It feels very, very similar to JavaScript, like the paradigms are kind of mixing up. You have first level functions, you have immutable data structures, uh, you have automatically occurring functions. Um, everything is kind of like really, really neatly connected together. And it's strongly typed, the tooling is there. This language has been here for 20 years. It was a little bit unlucky because it was one year released after Java. Maybe if it would be faster, maybe we would be all OCaml okay developers by now. I'm not sure. Anyways, this language exists. It has a compiler, it has a package manager, it has a developer tool called Merlin. It does all the auto-completion for you and integrates with the editor. And then we have Reason. And the compiler is quite cool because from the very first version they kind of like wanted to support syntax extensions. So syntax extensions are kind of built in, into OCaml. And what they did is, um, Jordan Walk, the creator of uh, Re uh, React, he was saying he wants people to understand OCaml better. Or he wanted to just like experiment how it would be if you would put JavaScript syntax on top of OCaml. So the syntax of Reason looks very, very similar to JavaScript developers. And um, this is kind of a huge deal because they also want to integrate the NPM ecosystem and with the OCaml ecosystem. So suddenly you have a language which can uh, compile to a native executable, which can be used server-side, or 
can be transpired to JavaScript, similar like TypeScript, in a strongly typed way. And on top of this, like the hope of this whole project is to get the JavaScript community into the OCaml ecosystem. And this would be huge because OCaml needs the community as well. So how do we do this JavaScript thing? How, do, how does OCaml does it? There's a tool called BuckerScript. It's developed by Bloomberg. And it has been around for a while, but it really got popular by reason because um, what it does is it takes reason files and OCaml files and transpiles them one to one to JavaScript uh, files. And it's also, the tooling is available on NPM, so you install the whole tool chain by npm install, that's it. And then you can run it uh, and transpile OCaml out. If you think about JavaScript tooling, so when you start a project, just think about it. What tools do you need? You need, first of all, you need ESLint, you need Babel to transpile the newest ES7 features. You need Webpack to, to pack everything together. You need Flow and Flow type to have static types. You need, maybe if you want to be functional, you need Render or Lodash or Immutable Chess. This is all like super loosely coupled. It's very hard to maintain. With Reason, you don't need all this stuff. The only thing you have is BuckleScript, Webpack, and a tool called Reformat. And Reformat is also very good. Um, if you're familiar with Go or with Haskell or whatever, they have a tool which is like just a formatting tool. They take the syntax of your code, make an AST out of it, and then pretty print it back again in a human readable way while preserving all the comments and everything. This is, I mean, it sounds like nothing, but if you have been using prettier chairs lately, it takes away all the bike shedding. Suddenly you don't have any code styling guides, and actually you don't even need ESLint anymore if you just have nice formatting, at least what I say. If you have uh, like prettier and flow, I'm pretty sure you don't need ESLint, but that's an opinion, I don't know. Um, so we just need these three tools to have a very, very concise um, like tooling. And, okay, so I can't tell you whatever I want because you don't know the language, so how could we how could we achieve something like this, like an, an application? So let's make an example. And my favorite example, if you hear me talk about reason, is a tic-tac-toe game, because everyone is familiar with the system and it's, it's kind of interesting to, how many ways are there to define a tic-tac-toe game? So let's start. Maybe let's start with flow, so you're familiar with the syntax. So let's define our models. This is the first thing we do. So first of all, we define a token which we put into the cells, which is X, O, and empty. And you can see these are string literals. <coughs> so we're really defining a token which is in the, in the space of the JavaScript runtime, a string. Then we have a board, which consists is an array of tokens. So we have an array of nine fields, which all have a token. So either they are empty or have an O or X in there. Then we have a player which can be X or O, or let's call it circle, X or circle, and which are also string literals. And then we have progress, because we need to define a progress for the game. So there are three states. So we can have either a turn, someone is playing right now. So who is the player who is playing right now? We have a win, which is a player, and then we have a draw. That's it. And now we define a state. So if we are using React, we have a component which gets props, and this is like the game, what we want to render. We have a board and we have a progress, that's it. So let's see the types in action. If we want to instantiate a game, we say it's a turn and it has a, a player. Actually, it's not game, it's progress, sorry. Um, I forgot to change the slides again. So of understanding what data structure you're handling. It's called an intersection type. Um, if type is of case turn, it will know it has a player attribute. And it knows the player has the attribute, uh, like the, the type of player. So you can deconstruct that safely without null checking and just return a string. The same with win. We just do that. Okay. So there are many, many problems I have with the switch clause. And you probably also have. Um, a lot of people call this pattern matching. For the cheap, it's like cheap pattern matching in JavaScript. So switch is no expression. 
The switch statement is a data control structure. So if you're going in like an if else, um, it doesn't return a value. If you call switch, you cannot just say const result equals switch. This doesn't work. You have this object. You always have to handle objects with a type attribute, which is also very hard to maintain because you have to you know, define, if you haven't been using Redux, you need to define all the string literals and you need to dis, uh, define all the action types, which is really, which is really tedious. And then, the infer is sometimes brittle. Sometimes you just go into the wrong case because you made a typo, and then you deconstruct on the attribute player, which also exists, and then you have suddenly a different type. Also, maybe you noticed that I did a mistake in this <coughs> program. So, winner is not actually there, there's only win. And yeah, you will have a hard time finding this problem. So, also, we have no checks of exhaustiveness. So, if there is another case like draw, we would not even react on that. And we don't even know we leave that out. So, this is kind of hard. There are tricks how you can uh, enforce exhaustiveness, but I don't like like this, you know, syntax tricks to, to make this work, because you will forget them. Ah, oh, yeah. Also, it's got both syntax. We have a fall-through clause. If you don't break, it goes to the next case. It's also very tedious. Okay. Now forget everything I told you. Now we go into reason syntax. So, first of all, we define a type token, and uh, the first thing you will notice is that the type is lowercase. This is just the way how OGAMO defines types. And we start with a pipe, which is also very useful because sometimes you want to add values and then you just always use a pipe in front. With X, O, and empty. And these are not values. These are types. These are called tags. And the nice thing about it, they are not showing up in your runtime unless you're using a sum tag sum, uh, which is a little bit more complex. You will see that later. We have a type row, which is a tuple, a fixed set of free tokens. So you cannot really instantiate a row which has two tokens or one token. It has to have three tokens. We have a board, which consists of three rows, same principle. Um, we have a player, which is X or O, or circle. And then we have a progress. And this is the most interesting part. Can you remember this, like this progress in JavaScript, which was a huge mess of intersection types? We don't have that here anymore, because we have type variants. So what it does is, we can define uh, a type term, which has a payload of, of type player. So we can uh, use types as values as well. And these will be compiled out later on. And then we have our tick toe state, which looks the same. All right. OK, so let's see how this looks like. So we define a game, which is turn x. <coughs> we don't have any typecasting. We don't have any, any fancy stuff here. And then we just switch on the game. And switch is actually match in OCaml, and this is a pattern match. This is a properly pattern matched expression. First of all, this expression will return a string, because all of these cases return a string. So we can assign a value to that. We have a deconstructuring of all our tags. So if it's a turn, we get a payload player. And now we can work with the player object. And here it's a statically typed language, so we need to kind of like uh, cast it to a string then we concatenate them. The last expression of the statement is also the return value, which is very similar to CoffeeScript. And then, if you would leave out a case, the type checker will emit a warning, which tells us that you're missing the case draw, or you're missing the case win. If you just want to ignore it, you can have a default case, which reacts on every um, other pattern, which is not there. You can pattern match on arrays, you can pattern match uh, with uh, multiple values and then have specific like, you know, permutation cases. Um, it's a very, very, very powerful feature, which in my opinion is already worth like switching to this language, just like to have proper pattern matching. Because you, like, if you have optional values, you can also switch on optional values. And this is the comparison to the JavaScript stuff. All right. So how would you do the validator procedure? So first of all, um, we only have the let keyword for defining a variable or a function. We define a function parse game JSON exception. So we get some data from our server which gets the tic-tac-toe state. It gets a text 
parameter, which is a string. And we don't even have to type this information. We don't even have to tell how the function is being defined in, type, in types, because just by the use of this body, similar to flow, it will infer the types of your input and output parameters, or return values. So we use a specific subset of buckle script, which enables us to, to parse a JSON of the specific type. And we define, with the decode we just defined, uh, we want to take this JSON block and just refine it to a board in progress. So if there is something happening in there, so if there is no board or progress in there, it will throw an exception. And we can also pattern match an exception with a try um, statement and reason. And then, when we have this shape, we can say it's an array of string, but it's not well interpreted. So we need to uh, convert it first so that our game will understand it. For instance, we have tokens X and O, and in JSON we would serialize them as a string, but we need to convert them to back to types X and O, like uh, you should have seen before. So we need to convert the data as well. And yeah, this is like this. We have a powers board and a powers broker somewhere. Uh, defined. And here we make it a little bit easier to read. We can also define the return type, which is the facto state. And this is how it would look like in, in flow or types. Okay, so now we have the server. How do we fetch the data? There is also like something uh, called the promise namespace, and we can have a fetch function, which is um, an external binding you can install with npm. And then you just do the same thing as in JavaScript. It's very similar syntax-wise. We try, like the reason team tries to, to be as close as possible to the JavaScript syntax. Maybe you were wondering why is the dangling underscore? That's because uh, then is also a keyword, so they cannot really do that. So there are some dirty things, but in general, if you get the idea of what you try to do, um, it's very very pleasant to work with the code and to refactor. So this is again how it would look like. Okay, and now we define our components. And in React, we have something which is called a reducer component. If you're familiar again with Redux, in Redux you have a global state. Reason tries to eliminate this whole Redux terminology. They try to say, don't use Redux in that case because we don't really need it. The language supports it by default. So what we have is a reducer component. And we call it tic-tac-toe, and we have actions, very similar to Redux actions, or Elm actions. We have play turn with a selection, and we have restart. And then we just um, have a make function which defines our render and our initial state. So you can see, here's our render function, initial state, and then there's this reducer part. And there, we just have an action with our current state, and we we switch on the action, see what kind of action happens, and then we tell reason how to handle this. So we can say update, we can say no update, we can, so we can really tell the reconciler later on in React 16 what to do. And this is very cool because suddenly we can influence the way how the, the, the rendering works. And then we just tell it um, the new state right here. So if you say restart, we just use the initial state, it will take the result and then re-render the, the component efficiently. And everything you see here is well-typed. That's the nice thing about it. So how would the render function look like? Very similar to how you would do it in JavaScript. We have GSX, um, which is also well-typed. There are no funky side effects with the children property anymore. Uh, if you have been using Flow with GSX, you will know that there are some downsides if you do higher order components and stuff like this. So here it's very easy to, to handle this. Um, the only thing which is new is this reduce function, which will be uh, passed as a property, and we just uh, emit our selection as an action, that's it. And here you can see how we can manage the, like, the flow of, or the rendering of your application, of your data. You make it explicit. It's very easy to, to miss a case sometimes. Maybe you pass in a null value and you don't know it, or maybe you have a data loading and you don't know how to express data loading. Sometimes you have a tracking value called fetching equals true or false, and then it gets out of sync and you have the data and suddenly you see the spinner, like this kind of stuff. 
And with pattern matching, it's much, much easier to cope with all these changes. So this statement just returns a new GSX, as I said, it switches the statement. And we go into our cases, and then we just have utility functions returning GSX. That's it. Super easy. All right. Library definitions. I don't want to go into this one because it's like the most complex thing of them all. Because you need to use uh, something which is called uh, like externals. It's like a, if you're familiar with C or something, like uh, foreign function bindings, where you call um, other other code. Other code. It's very hard to ex explain right now. But um, for instance. If you look into the BSJSON project, BS is the namespace for bucket script. There are many projects on there which bind to certain libraries, like Reason, and you can just read the, the definition of these, and you can see what kind of types they emit. It's just um, a wrapper, a statically typed wrapper around your JavaScript, so you can safely call JavaScript. Okay, user interaction is also strongly typed, as I said, with Reason React you get all the static bindings you need to not make any mistakes. So if you have a click function, you know you need to use a mouse event with a click. And you can see it over there, so we get a mouse event and it returns unit, which is nothing. All right. Um, this whole thing, like this whole tic-tac-toe app is a full stack application, so what you see is the front end. And there's also an OCaml server implementation which will synchronize the state between the front end uh, and the back end. And you can find this on GitHub, so if you want to check it out, just to see, to get a feeling of how a fully typed code this looks like. It's really nice. To recap, first of all, Flow is great. I would always use Flow if I would use JavaScript. But I try to go a little bit more into the reason field, so I can use OCaml for the back end stuff I'm building right now. Uh, we, tr I try to achieve a fully typed application architecture. Uh, I try to have sound bindings to my libraries. Also try to evangelize it because if people build their libraries with static types in mind, the library bindings are much, much easier to write. And then I try to figure out a way how to automate this validator thing, how we can generate validators uh, just out of the type information. There are tools in OCaml how you can do this. and. Yeah, if you got this settled, you can have such a great time refactoring. All right, so that's it. Thanks, and I'm open for questions.